Casey Schilf. I'm a Design for America alumni from Case Western Reserve University, where I started this studio. I now work as a design strategy consultant, and I help out with the alumni experience for Design for America. Um, so before we get started, I'd like to thank a few people. So Agency, EA, and Savage Smith for this beautiful space. So if we could give them a round of applause. interactive art display. So if you have not checked out and participated in that, please do after the panel. So let's give a round of applause to Rich. As well as thank you to Chicago Design Week team and AIGA for um, allowing us to take part in this week. So thank you. Professor of Design at Northwestern, Liz Gerber. Thanks, Lexi. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I'll keep this short because we have fabulous, fabulous panelists up here. Um, I was reflecting on the theme for tonight, and I was thinking about who is a designer. And when I first got into design, um, to be a designer, you had to be male, wearing a black turtleneck, and have little, little glasses. Um, and it's striking to me how much that's changed. Um, since I've been in design. Another thing when I first got into design is you had to design physical products or buildings. Those are your kind of two options. Um, and now we're thinking about services and experiences, and I know there's many of those um, designers in the room, so that's very exciting. The other thing when I first got into design that's changed is we had to think about, we first thought about, um, her, uh, excuse me, a Bucky film, uh, uh, He said, you can either make sense or you can make money as a designer. And I, I just, I, I've been thinking a lot about that. Um, he's a very, he, he, very smart guy, but I don't think that was very smart. Um, I think a lot, a lot of things have changed. Um, and I think it's possible now to, um, to do both. And so a lot has changed in design. And I was thrilled last week, Design for America was at the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum. Um, as part of Design Week celebration in New York. It was really wonderful. And what was so encouraging to me was that all these, these trends and these, um, this breadth of design that I'm talking about, both in terms of who is, who is a designer, what can they design, and what can you get from design, um, were all really reflected in the, um, in the recipients uh, of this award. And it was, it was really humbling to be there. And so with that, um, I'm so excited to have this very interesting group um, of panelists who will discuss, and hopefully, um, I'm hoping there's some conflict. I mean, healthy. Yeah, like, I know, Jason's here, so we're all set on that one. And the women are going to win. This was not by design. This was, I don't think. I don't think. Um, anyway, I'm going to turn it over to Lexi, who's going to moderate. But just thank you so much all for being here. Um, I'm really excited to see all the different faces and to explore tonight this very interesting topic of who is a designer, Lexi. that does 
design is more and more important. So the picture on the right of that slide is the result of a study of 5,000 Americans in kind of second size cities. And it's a picture of two versions of a library. One library is deemed more welcoming than the others, in part because design has been inserted and it has things like benches and plants. And a lot of times, that's what we talk about when we talk about design and who is a designer. Can't we all just make design thinking accessible and have people be aware? People are valuing design. This is a horrible slide for this room, but what you're looking at is on the Left-hand side, a picture of the 53 schools slated by Chicago Public Schools for closing. It's a picture from the WBEZ website. And on the right-hand side, you see, again, a map in tape by a really fabulous public interest designer, Paula Aguera. And really, really small on there are pictures of where all those schools are and the status of them is color-coded. What school is closed and remains closed? What school is... Uh, has been sold, what school has now been developed possibly into condos. And at the bottom, you see one of the most spectacularly beautiful mid-century modern schools in the city of Chicago, Overton Elementary. It's being reinvented as a business and technology incubator. I've spent my life in schools. It is one of the most spectacular design schools from an architectural and educational standpoint. Nobody gave a shit about the design of these schools when they decided to close them. It, it was not a factor. Every single thing about the intentionality of design was irrelevant to the decisions when it came time to close these schools. Which brings me to the last question. Do we really believe that everyone is a designer? And I think that if you go to the definition of design, and because I came up through the University of Chicago, I went to the Oxford English Dictionary. <laughs> The definition of design is a plan or drawing produced to show the look or function of a building, a garment, an object before it's made. It comes from the Latin to designate. If you look at any of anybody else's definitions, it's all about it's something that has intentionality. Goal, purpose, creative, plan, scheme. My point is it's intentional. How do we make sense of the design of a city where these are two photographs of the same city? How do we argue that everyone is a designer when these pictures were taken four miles apart in what's supposed to be a great American city? So the question is not just about is everybody a designer, but who's in a position to make decisions about design? And lastly, what do we do about a dearth of design or lack of intentionality? And this is also the impact. The end. <laughs> and I don't, I'm kind of a rogue and, um, and bad at authority. I came up with my own definition of design. <laughs> That's okay. Um, to me, design is people with ideas and people with the power to enact them in dialogue in some way, shape, or form. And I'll tell you about how that works in terms of journalism. Sorry, these are going to be a little bit small. But on the left is how journalism is typically designed as a process. Uh, people in the newsroom are kind of deciding and telling the world, here's what we think you need to know. They're at a remove from the people that they're serving. The public that they are working with is kind of seen as an abstraction, like data, demographics, or dollar signs. And what we're trying to do with Harkin is really flip the design model as to who gets listened to and who has decision-making power around what information gets created by journalists. And so what we're trying to do is uh, create a new model called public power journalism. And what it asks instead is what do you not know that we can find out for you. Because as journalists, all day long, we have time to figure out the stuff you don't know. So help us design what information you're getting. And so how it works, and this is, sorry, this is a little tough to see, but I will walk you through it. Anyone heard of Curious City here on WBZ? Okay, yay! Um, so I started that program um, in 2012 as a way of kind of hacking the process of how journalism gets made. And really having the public start that process instead of be subjected to whatever the newsroom decides and get to comment or, you know, most people turn, turned off comments on the news sites, unfortunately. So there's really no back and forth and no learning. 
And so I'm just going to tell you a quick story about um, what happened here when the model was flipped and the public had the power to decide what stories the newsroom did. So this woman, Luann, here, she wanted to know, just curious, if Chicago's Arab and African American Muslims share mosques. She didn't have a dog in the fight, she was just curious. She passes by a couple and wanted to know, you know, do they cross-pollinate? Do people go to each other's mosques? And so she asked Curious City, they decided to do a story on it. They brought four imams into the newsroom to talk about it. And at the end of that session of, of them recording, they said, you know what, this is a problem. Our communities don't interact. There's class differences, there's language differences, there's all these different things that we should really talk about. And what they did is they asked the newsroom a couple months later, could you facilitate a dialogue with our communities? And so the public ended up changing the design of what newsrooms do and what products they make. And what WBEZ ended up doing is actually serving as a facilitator in that community, not to put out a show or to put out an article, but just to be a servant of people who had information needs that needed to be met. So that's another cool outcome of when the public gets to be part of that process. Um, the other great thing that we're learning, you might have heard journalism has an economic uh, problem right now, a business model problem, among other problems like being attacked by our highest office, etc. Um, but what we're learning is that the more the public feels heard and the more they see you're serving them directly, basically the more involved they are in designing the thing that you're making, the more likely they are to trust and to pay you. It's not a surprise if you've done community organizing, you've known this all along, but journalists are just getting hip to this. Um, the last thing I want to say, and this is going to be really hard to read, but I think good design and good outcomes from design really start with the questions that we're asking. I talk to a lot of newsrooms and they sometimes put this false dichotomy next to each other. Of, Should we give the public what they want or what they need? And that's the newsroom <laughs> like acting as a parent, you know, and like, they're not my dad. Like, why? You don't have to tell me what I want or need. Like, Instead, if you ask the question, what do you not know that we can find out for you, the design of the newsroom goes from being a parent of the public to being a servant of the public. And that changes all the processes, it changes all the metrics, and it changes all the outcomes. So that is the quick and dirty on Harkin. Thank you. Project Osmosis and After School Matters decided to teach an all boys program at Block 37 and Gallery 37 to show the world in Chicago that young men have the power to create peace in their communities through design thinking. The power to become artists with brands that can make an impact on the world. The power to become the voice that speak out these violence in their communities. The power to become design explorers.
Design's a problem solving tool. So once you recognize that there's a problem and you go in to try to solve it, then you become a designer, especially when you look for creative processes to do that. Yeah, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let me see if I can follow that. Uh, yeah, it's me. Hey, I'm Jason, uh, from the city of Chicago. It'll be a pretty quick, ooh, you got some little background there. I thought he'd be on a black background. Okay, so here's the deal. Uh, you know, I didn't go to the Oxford. Uh, yeah, he's a little, he's a little scary. That, that is, Christopher Alexander is such a smart designer, he radiates negative energy and color, forms light. It's okay, uh, I didn't go to Oxford, I went to Alexander because he's an architect, so I'm stealing something out of Gabe's playbook, okay? So the form is the solution, the context defines the problem, right? We're all problem solvers, as Vernon said. So, okay, here we are solving how do you make fire? Okay, it was a long time ago, but we had to figure out like fire helps us, you know, eat more nutritional food. We don't have to chew as much. Let's make some fire. Let's get some flint. Those are hand tools, right? Hey, same process. Let's invent democracy, right? We just make all this up, right? So that's, that's how design works, right? It didn't exist before, and then we try it out and we see the so we follow a process and we see if it goes, right? Now, here's the problem. <laughs> That's not how it works, right? We get to say we're designers, but we have to then figure out what the methods are, right? It's like when you're a doctor, you don't become a doctor by saying, I'm a doctor, I went to first aid class once, and now I can perform brain surgery. You say, hey, I'm a doctor, or I think being a doctor is important, so I'm going to go through the whole training and do the whole thing. If you don't do that, you're just really good at applying pressure until a doctor shows up, which is fine, right? Because it's intentionality. Intentionality is you're helping your community. Same thing with design. We're all solving problems, and then now tonight we're going to debate as to whether we're designers or not. When do we cross the threshold? When do we have enough intentionality? When do we have enough training that we can put a name tag on that says designer and then, you know, go to work with it? So here we go. Let's talk. Great. Oh, so Thank you. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Design is done, it's either intentional or not intentional, right? It's just, can you actually design and get the results? Like if I tried designing products, physical products, they'd all look very terrible. They'd look more like the Flint than the Constitution, you know? But that would be my effort, and I'd say, oh, you, here we go. And then people wouldn't like it until they get somebody else to design, and then the marketplace of ideas will find a good design in that way. That's my rant on all. Does anyone have something to add? Well, I mean, I don't know. I think. 
I think the issue that's been on my mind a lot, particularly like placement, I love the the CRISPR Alexander slide before the on board slide, but I think I think it's really important when we say something like everyone is a designer, to not be glib about the privilege embedded in that statement. So with the Project Asmosis video, what you saw was the development of an explicit language development to allow you to participate ultimately in decision making. And I think because I'm at an institution where like, we had, when I did my job, we had like on a wall this big, the words, everyone is a designer. When I got there, I really, I was like, yes, right, democracy. True, anybody can discover a dinosaur. Anybody, like anybody can do it. That's also a true story, but a different panel. Um, uh, but the more time I'm spending in the world of design straight up, and the more I'm spending time in a world where neighborhoods and communities are shaped by the decisions of a handful of people, I think the more acutely concerned I am that if we don't take seriously the position of privilege we're in, when we have a skill set, and, and most of all the intentionality, I think we're doing a disservice to assume that like a person can, a person can critique their lived experience. Their experience really matters. And so what I, I feel a lot is Let's value the experience, but not then be dismissive of it by being like, okay, because you've had this experience and you have this critique, you're also a designer. Because the decisions in the built environment only get made by a few people. And I love like what Jennifer, you just said about help us design. What do you want to know? And then let us go work our magic in service. So I think these are the kinds of things that have been in my mind is not to be dismissive of a position of privilege where intentionality and the ability to make decisions that shape how other people's experiences matter. Like, let's take that really seriously and understand its position of privilege and not that many people usually do it, even though everybody's experience actually can contribute to the critique of what works and what doesn't. Well, and I, I mean, to that point, I mean, for, so we get it from some certain angles. One of the issues I know from the community that I'm, that I'm from when it comes to design, the threshold changes. Or it's changed over the years. Um, and one of the things that people, from what I've known in coming up and going to design school, I went through all the traditional processes and all that. Although I just gave a dear friend a book on Leroy Winbush, who was basically didn't go through any of that process and wound up designing some of the most important pieces in Chicago as a designer with no formal training, with no, but he told himself as a youngster that he was a and he put himself on the road of, uh, of what design uh, was as a problem solving tool. Not only solving problems in his community, but also becoming a mentor. So what I'm trying to get at is, you showed a slide earlier that showed the city of Chicago, and then it showed the slum part of Chicago. I think there are designers in both locations, it's about resources. You know, some may have the dollars to attend certain schools and to go to certain places, others, may not have any of those resources, but that does not mean because that line is there of resources that one cannot be literally what I would call a successful designer. I think there are designers who've designed things uh, like Chuck, Chuck Harrison who designed the Viewmaster and who did all these things, who's just now on the map of really getting what you would call marginal credit uh, as a designer for, what he, for the work that he did. So, to me, it's more about not so much who's been dubbed a designer, you know, or you know, you, you're on the radar of designers, or you went to Bauhaus and you know the Euro approach to design. To me, that's not what a designer is defined as. A designer is someone who can look at the creative process, solve a creative problem, uh, in many cases don't get recognized for it, but are, is true to that craft. And it's dedicated to it. So I think that's a little bit more of the process. Okay, I feel like I have to not say something for each question, but I, um, the, the thing uh, that I would just say to this, which is, is playing off of some of the other things that were said, is that maybe you can, anyone can call themselves a designer as far as I'm concerned. I won't be offended if you've never designed anything. But um, did it accomplish what it was intended to do? And did it satisfy the people using it in 
what it was designed to do. If anything, you can check off, like, I designed something. Whether or not you want to call yourself a capital D designer, like, it's up to you, your business card. Uh, I want to kind of just jump in on this, because I think this question of, like, agency resources, intentionality is really important. And like from back to the school design conversation and and in Chicago school closings, right? Because they have a big impact. We could pick up other ones. But Eve Ewing has written a book and there was this great article in the reader interview with her. But she did something really interesting. She put a design filter on the different processes. And so, and so just to kind of piggyback on what you're saying, there was a school that was closed. It was called Ogden Elementary School, and it merged with a school called Jenner. But there was this multi-year process that a lot of people were involved in, and when you look at a list of schools that were closed, they're not on it. Even though what essentially happened was one school closed and some of those kids went into another school because the community was much more involved, the leadership at the schools played a role in deciding what do we need, how do we want it to work, and I think there's, you know, this issue of intentionality, but also access to resources in the process. So the Jenner Ogden merger is seen as an example of community input and design, and the, all these other schools who maybe would have been just as happy to participate in that. You know, they were given three minutes, shut up, sit down, next. We heard your opinion. So going along with that, um, it's a lot of talk about resources. I know Vernon, we've talked about how design can be a bridge. So how do we give that permission um, to have more people using these methods? I mean, I, I think it's first important to start with the landscape of who has the to rights to be a designer. I'm not saying, and I suppose it's not about just raising an army of designers. It's, it's about a thinking. Uh, one of our mission lines is dream self-expression community. So we're about really helping individuals to see the power of design, being able to express themselves, and knowing it as a tool for change. Once you, I mean, anybody that just picks up a hammer is not automatically a carpenter, I, I get it, what you're saying. But, but I'm saying if you don't have a hammer, <laughs> and you don't have nails, if you don't have, then you can't, that doesn't mean that you don't have aspirations to be one. That means that you just don't have a hammer and a nail. Um, so, one of the things we say with osmosis, and when we talk with our, our young people, and we, we say we serve, we serve from K to 60, you know, because there's just this need of people who've never had an opportunity to express their creativity. Um, so everybody has the human right, first of all, to be, to be creative. And that's why we showed the slide about design explorers, because it's about uh, exploration. It, it is a process with a, with a means to an end, you know. Um, I mean, I have a design. Chicago, we design projects and products. And so I can see an end result, but I can also remember when I first went through that process and, and did work on one of my first projects, and when I, as a person of color, was basically told, well, you know, people of color aren't really designers. I mean, you just don't see them. And so it was more of about a, a, of a, of a archaic thinking than it was about a process at all. So I think we have to be careful of, of, of knowing who has the potential of being, of, of being a creator uh, versus who's been pre-built as being a creator. Um, so along, going along those lines, are there, what would be the implications if we share these methods with everyone? Well, I mean, I think you know, I know I'm being like a little bit snarky about this, but I actually think if you don't take seriously what Trevor just said, we won't, we'll continue to have a, a set of decision makers with a design skill who had access to schools, who have the capital D and it's on their business card, and it's not gonna reflect the diversity of our city or communities. And so I think part of the issue is you have to take seriously that this is an extremely powerful toolkit extremely powerful, and it's been not available. Um, ironic, I'm gonna tell you a little history story. So how many people have heard of the plan of Chicago, 1909 plan of Chicago? Okay, some of you have. So there was a fire in Chicago, it was really big, it was in 1871. It was a big deal. And part of the issue was when the city got done with the fire, it grew back, started to grow back really, really quickly. And the business community was like, 
screw this. If we grow this fast without a plan, we're never going to be able to make money, and we're never going to be able to be a world-class city. So they commissioned this guy, Daniel Burnham, and this other guy, and they made this plan. And it's part of the reason Chicago has double-decker Wacker Drive. It's part of the reason why we have these boulevards that connect parks. But here's the thing a lot of people don't know. There was a textbook version of the Wacker, of, of the Burnham plan that was required reading for all eighth graders. And eighth grade was when you graduated high school at the turn of the century. And the introduction of that book that was required reading for every public school student was, the city will only be great through our united civic efforts. And then it went down and it broke down the building blocks of the city. And, and the working assumption was if you are born in Chicago, you are the future heads of households, and you need to be on this as a real issue. That assumption built in that was, again, required reading for every kid in public schools, and those public schools were much more integrated than ours were today, um, that is not a working assumption for young people. That you have the power, you're expected to do it, and you gotta do it together. And that was a design call to action. Yeah, a plus one on that. I mean, you know, uh, I'll just say it's like, okay, so we're all designers, right? So we're all sitting here and we, we do the stuff, right? We label things, we like labeling things. But all the stuff we're talking about, it's not about the labels, right? It's about whether you have the resources, the mindset, and everything else. You know, I, I work for the city, we just, we're in the middle of budget hearings, right? So we sit and we watch the budget hearings. We're, we're all asked to go down and observe to see what happens. You know, the two things happen. One, there's a lot of political grandstanding. There's been a lot of questions about the actual budget and how it's being spent, which is a little depressing. The second fact is there's nobody there from us, right? There's not a lot of residents who hang out there and sit and listen and go, where is my tax dollars going? How are they being spent? And what is happening with the money? And what's happening with my neighborhood, et cetera? Maybe some people get involved with, with the aldermanic community or somebody else, but it, it's pretty opaque. And I guess the point is just like, you know, as we talk about this, you know, I, I see it every day. Like within our city, we have a lot of folks who make decisions on some of the stuff that Gabe is talking about. And I say that my job within the city is really threefold, right? It's culture, process, product. Because our culture doesn't really respect or understand design. It's not very literate in design. So we need to think about when we make policy decisions, what are the design tools we can use to help people envision how those policy decisions will actually impact people? What are the tools we can use to make sure when we launch programs, when we take programs away, that we're making sure we're doing it in a thoughtful manner that involves the community, right? That's a lot of what my job is, is basically making sure that we're listening and that we see ourselves as designers and we see the systems that we're building as having real outcomes that impact people. And like everybody knows that, but like it's my job basically to sit there and advocate for that. And the second part is really to make sure we're getting resident voice in the stuff that we do for the same reason, right? If people aren't being involved and actually um, getting consulted in the way in which we do the work we do, then we basically ship things that people don't recognize or don't want, and we waste money and time. So the more we can get people working as part of the process, the better stuff we ship, and the better it is for the residents who use that stuff. Right? Yeah, and I would add to that, I think one of the greatest um, gifts that design can give is power literacy, like how power flows throughout a system and where you can intervene and where are the levers, and. Um, how has it flowed historically? How could it flow you know, in the future if you change things around? Um, so quick, quick story just in terms of like how, how people can intervene when they understand how the city works. Um, someone asked a question of Curious City a, a year or two ago about um, why are there no statues of famous female Chicagoans? Any statue of a woman in Chicago is figurative. It's like an angel or hands, but not, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but like we've had a few, uh, more than a few kick-ass women who have called Chicago home to be well to start with. Um, and there haven't been statues made of women. And so someone just wanted to know why aren't there and what's the process by which someone gets cast in bronze and put out into the public square so people can point to their kids and be like, that person was important. Look, you can be like that person. Um, and so, yeah, right? So Curiosity ended up just explaining how power flows in terms of how statues get made. And lo and behold, because the democratic imagination was opened by people understanding, oh, that's how it works. You gotta, you know, lobby that person and go to that meeting and do that thing. Then now there's a whole group of people coming together to determine which statues of women in Chicago should be created and where they should be put. And part of it was just the opacity of the process was not made clear and it wasn't um, anything that, that folks could grasp and understand. So I feel like great design 
also teaches you um, where you can intervene. I, I love that. I love that story. I want to give you back. The picture that I showed of, uh, of kind of shining downtown, juxtaposed against a neighborhood, a normal person in their day-to-day -day life has no idea how that happened. If they live in a neighborhood that's been dis actively disinvested in, they've experienced it, especially if they've been there for one or two, maybe three generations. But it's very, very hard to understand how that happens functionally. So we get a lot of, well, they don't care, and this or that. The idea that there's like retail zoning, or they put all the industry on the far southeast side, and then you couldn't have other kind of things. Like the lack of transparency, in some ways, maybe one of the design tools at work. So this idea of like seeing through the eyes of a designer, it's like this magic wand. So like putting those powers to work, developing the language, it's, it's, extra, it's an extraordinarily powerful tool, but it's also like a set of glasses not everybody gets. And when it comes to something like the city, how do you understand that without like going to school or spending a lot of time in the city? It's, it's really hard. It's really, really hard. It takes a lot of work. And, and I mean, and, and again, you know, in thinking about the whole process and about design, Let's face it, there's good design and bad design, right? Uh, red tape is design. Right. <laughs> you know, that, that's a design. It's a very clever design, too. It, it, it's, it's, if you live in the city of Chicago, and you can go from two blocks and go maybe over ten other blocks, and the landscape completely changes. Let's not fool ourselves. That, that, they're, they're, that's design thinking behind it in a, in a negative way. Uh, but. So we, I think we have to be careful about the language we speak in very early stages when it comes to creators. For example, you take a young potential Olympian, they start in infancy almost. They're told, you know, you're a young gymnast. <laughs> you're, you can, they stand and they do, you know, I know some youngsters that do that right now. You get pose, right? Well, what are they being taught? They're being told at a very young age that, you know, you may not be there yet, but you have to in many, many cases, they are told that that's what they are. I'm a product of that. My mother wanted to be a designer. So when I was a shorty, as we say, as I was a shorty, um, I did my little doodles and drawings, and my mother took my drawings and put it on the refrigerator on the low end of St. Louis, and smacked and said, baby, that's your, you can be anything you want. And I was like, you know what? I'm a designer, just like my mama. <laughs> you know, and so the, the reason I'm saying that's so critical to the development of the person's process because that's that's like getting an invitation. You know, so if you never get that invitation, or if you never even told that it exists, then so my thing is not, like I said, I'm not just saying everybody automatically is, I'm not saying that there's not work involved. I'm not saying that there's not, you know, and I'm not saying that there's responsibility. There's a lot of responsibility that comes with it. Uh, but I'm saying that everyone has that potential as well as they should have the resources available if they choose to go that road. And so I suppose this is about, it's a scientific term, and it means uh, fluids going from one end of the spectrum to the other, right? So we just put the word creative in that, which is what, that's why you see the three circles, the three rings. So it's sort of this symbiont thing. So at the end of the day, we all should have those touch points to get back to creating something amazing and being something great. But without having that beginning stage, you never get to that third end, to that third side. Is anybody taking notes on this? By the way, it's okay. So far, we had a lot of good stuff. I just wanted to, that, that thing blew me away. So you're saying everybody's a designer, but then the world either takes it away or doesn't reveal it to you unless the people who are around you sort of open that door for you and show you that it's there like your mom did. Mm -hmm. Vernon, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Hey, hey. Yeah, it, it seems like everyone is talking about how it would be great if we could empower everyone to use these skills of design as a um, toolkit and understand the power behind it. But would there be any negatives if we begin sharing community members in the design process? And if we are considering more people, maybe not considering them designers,
but if we are spreading this widely, are there any negatives behind that? Or what are the implications? Well, um, I, I think it really depends on what your goals are. If your goal is designed for efficiency, and it's designed for maximizing profits, yeah, maybe you don't want to do that because having people in the process is going to slow it down. But if it's designed for effectiveness and trust and uh, better outcomes, then yeah, you sure as hell want to have people involved in the process so that whatever you're creating is its highest and best good of the use of your time, talent, and treasure. And so I think that um, having community involved uh, is bad if you're a stone-cold capitalist and great if you're not. <laughs> so that would be my, my two cents about it. Well, the, yeah, I think the bad things are overturning the status quo. I mean, and I mean that, you know. <clears throat> that's good, right? That's, if you like that, I do. If, if you go back to the Freedom School curriculum, which was at the heart of one of the largest voter education drives, uh, back in the 60s, if you read what that curriculum was, what were they actually teaching people? I would argue they were teaching people to look at the world with the eye of a designer. It was a hyper-focused curriculum of asking questions based on what you observe. What do some people have that we want? What literally are those things? How do they get them, right? I'm, I'm being a little bit, you know, um, doing a disservice, except that if actually you don't want change, don't people, don't teach people how to ask questions based on observations about what works and what doesn't. But if you like that, it doesn't actually take very much except to be explicit about the power of observation and questions. Absolutely, and I mean, and also I think when you look at, again, one of the videos we showed earlier, the Design Explorers video that was an all male program, as we know in Chicago, and the issue of violence and the, uh, what young men face, a lot of young men of color face. Um, one of the things we did in that program, we have what we call a creative startup conversation. So we basically sit and did a round table conversation similar to this and we said, you know, if you could use design to address the issue of violence, what would you do, what would you create? So the dialogue that came from that is what, you know, we wound up doing this mural called Brothers Gonna Work It Out. You know, we got a chance to show them some throwback 60s stuff. Maybe, you, know, you, know, you know, but 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 the point was, uh, it got them from that to looking at themselves because what they start to recognize is that people don't really know them, and so we turn we start using the design terminology, saying you know that's called branding. So basically, you've been misbranded. So how would you brand yourself versus what people are saying? About so then these young men, what you saw in the video was all their versions of their own brand of who they actually were. So when they came back out the box, right, and rebranded themselves, so then I, we would ask them, well, what's your name? You know, I'm Jay, you know, clothing so-and-so, ambassador. So it changed their whole perspective of, of using design as a tool for change within themselves. So I'm not saying, you know, that, you know, uh, that I'm just going, you're designing, you're designing, everybody designing. No, that's not what, um, what I'm saying is how powerful a tool of change it actually is. So with that, um, how do we protect the craft of design? How do we assure that it's, we have good designs? You talked about good and bad design. How do we assure that as people are using these really powerful tools um, that we keep the craft? I feel like we're, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Uh, exposure, um, exploring, uh, resources, invitation. We do a program with UIC. Uh, the program started because these young men were sitting outside, and I said, have you ever been into this university? They were like, no. And I was like, nobody ever invited you? No. So I went to the dean and said, you know, <laughs> and then a program was going on there. Fast forward 10 years. We have several designers that came out of that program that are professionals that are working. So if they weren't exposed, if they didn't get a chance to explore, they wouldn't become designers. So how do you protect the craft? You stay true to the craft. You introduce them to designers. We, we, we take our, our young people to design firms. We take them to museums. 
We take them to not just their own tribe or their own group. We'll take them to all of them, make sure that they get a very holistic view of what design and creativity is. And then we ask them the question when it's all said and done. Do you actually, do you want to be a designer? Some go, now that I find all that out, <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, others go, absolutely. The opening part of the title of this is In a Rapidly Changing World, right? Whatever the second part was. Um, <laughs> who is a designer? Who is a designer? But, you know, when you use the word good, that's not for us to say, right? So associating craft with a concept of good, I think is problematic. Again, kind of like, I'm here just being careful and paranoid and vigilant about all these things, but I think that, you know, good for a designer might be what the craft thinks is good, but it might not be real good for the people affected by the design, back to red tape, for example. So I think a lot of it is good from whose perspective. <laughs> and one of the things that's great about design, I think, is there is a, a process component and a reflection component and like a thoughtfulness component that, say that I, I spent 20 years in science, but that's not really part of that process necessarily. But so I think I think the best thing about the process is the question of good is automatically problematized. And the best when the craft works the best, that's when good is constantly being questioned for by and whose interest. Not as a trained designer, I say all that. With that, what what would you say is the call to action to many of the designers in the room? Transparency and documentation. Uh, as much as you can share how you think, what your process is, how you do it, and how others can learn, I think um, you'll find that you'll make ripples that you probably won't even know about or find out 10 years later when someone tells you um, that that happened. Um, one quick story I, I, I want to tell that relates to this transparency is I was really lucky to get to go to Oslo this last year and I'd never been there before and there's this gorgeous, gorgeous opera house that's designed beautifully so people can hang out on the roof it's really interesting, it's a, a very incredible building. And at the very bottom of it, there's um, a window that's into the costume shop of the actual opera house. You can see them making the costumes. And I, um, the woman who runs the opera house was there talking about it and someone asked, well aren't you afraid that it'll take away the mystique by having that window in and people getting to see you guys making the costumes, it'll ruin the magic? She said, absolutely not. This is one of the most popular features of the entire opera house is people getting to walk by and look in and see how things are made and understand more about the craft and appreciate the craft more. So I think I, I run across a lot of people who are afraid when they are transparent about what they do that it's going to somehow dissolve the magic or they're going to be held accountable for their decisions in a new way. But if anything, it just opens up new questions and new possibilities. And so I think whatever transparency you can build into your processes will, will only reward you and others. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, cool. Okay. So a couple things. Uh, so number one, because uh, I keep on skipping a bunch of questions, I build them all up. So okay, so number one, who do you involve? You involve everybody, because at least in my world, the design of stuff is, it's no longer like a, a craftsperson making a thing that they then send out into the ether. Right? It's these multidisciplinary teams. You're like one of many working on a thing. And so, you know, we need more people involved, because there are these multidisciplinary things that are built for many people to use, you know, uh, at least in the stuff that we're doing. I think the way you protect the craft ultimately comes down to apprenticeship. I think there needs to be a very clear path for people because you know, design, let's face it, we, okay. So I got, I, I have a bunch of architect drinking buddies, okay, and they always give me crap, right? Because they're like, you never had a real job, you know? I'm like, what are you talking about, you know? Well, you call yourself a designer, you've been an information architect, you've never been licensed, you've never been bonded, right? When you make stuff, if we make it wrong, it kills somebody. If you make it wrong, what happens? And I'm like, well, now what happens is, you know, Russians steal your information and, uh, you know, like, psychographically you're hooked on Facebook, and I hate to tell you, there's no program to get you off of it. But, uh, you know, so that's the stuff that goes wrong in our space, and we still don't even know what that is. So we're probably all painting the little hands on radium-dialed watches, and we're not really entirely aware of it, right? So the more that we produce our stuff in public, and the more that we talk about what we're doing with our stuff, the better off it is, not just for the people making the products who eventually you know, could either be sued or billionaires or whatever happens to these tech startup people. Uh, but basically the products could be better, they could impact the communities better. And let's face it, like the world is not a perfect place. We need more of these methods out in the world. 
you know, a Jason Fried used to say about like cookbooks, right? Like chefs make cookbooks because you don't go to a restaurant to watch them and learn how to cook, you go to eat, right? And if you want to make that thing at home and you're a super fan, then you buy the cookbook and you try it at home. Same thing with design. Like if everybody became a designer, suddenly nobody here who's a designer would be out of work. You would just have better clients who could talk to you better about the work that you're doing, get better conversation, right? That would be the difference. And I would, I would also say in a rapidly changing world, um, design is no longer for just a privileged few. And I think that organizations and structures that have that archaic thinking won't be around uh, for much longer. Um, you look at the landscape, and when you look at who's that potential, those young gems that I mentioned, uh, that, that, that spectrum is much broader, that bandwidth is much broader. By, because of technology and in a rapidly changing world, exposure to design is easier, it's global. You're right, there's, I agree with you, there's a, a lot more opportunities to screw up with design ideas too, right? Because of all this information and, you know, it's like when you get the YouTube, everybody has quick fixes now, you know. Uh, how, do I, how do I build this? We go on YouTube, I'm a professional now. I, I was able to make my own stand. And, no, I, I realize it's a craft and I have the utmost respect for design. But I don't believe in design being segregated to a privileged few and then also being viewed as something that's dictated to everyone as how it's to solve their problem. So I think that that's the thing that, you know, we really look at, you know, within the construct of osmosis, with my own practice, you know, we call ourselves uh, uh, art on the loose creative therapists, you know, because we've learned that this is, this is change, you know, it's like, sit down, tell me what's your problem, <laughs> what kind of creative solution do you need once you really, but, and so, even in the practice, we're doing things as a first time that we've never done before. So it's an ever-changing world, and I think it has to be open for people to really, you know, have an impact. I think uh, what I would say is for, the, for everybody in this room to just kind of remember that you, you are in a position of privilege because you have a skill set if you've been trained or because this is something that's important to you that you want to talk about, and so, being accessible, being welcoming, thinking about who's not in the room, thinking about the fact that you don't know everything, that your experience is probably not like the experience of the person next to you. I think the value of having design be more valued is the flip side of that is reminding ourselves that as designers, we really need to check in. <laughs> and so, you know, when I say everybody's not a designer, what I mean by that is everybody has the potential, so let's not be flippant when we say something like that because if you don't provide the language that allows people to participate, the awareness that the, the systems we experience are in fact a product of design and either you were at the table or you weren't. Maybe someone forgot to invite you because it didn't occur to them or maybe you weren't invited on purpose, right? That the explicitness is required and so, um, I think kind of remembering that that's, a, that's an exciting power to have, so use it for good. Yeah, that, that kind of makes me think of how coding has become really caught on and anyone can be a coder, but that's not the same with design. Design has a lot of language barriers of understanding the jargon behind it, um, and I think that's something that everyone in this room can do is be, help make the design methods more accessible. So with that, what questions do you have for each other? <laughs> so I'm kind of curious um, for Jason. Uh, so when this comes up in the context of kind of being in the city and in the administration, are there things that have been exciting to you in a positive way? Has there been something where like, oh, having the chance to actually talk about design, like that was really exciting or eye-opening for you? Because you're in a kind of an interesting place and there's not that many of you in other cities either. So that's also yeah, just no, it's no, thank you, it's a good question. Uh, you know, um, no. Uh, most of the time, I get really depressed by most of the things that I see day to day. No, I'm kidding. It's, it, we're in a new position, and it's, it's really new. Um, it's, you, you know, I'd say this. The thing that gets me most excited is like, because yesterday we did user testing at uh, Avalon Library, 
right? We went down to the south side, took the new three-in-one system that we have out there, and we took it out and showed it to people. And it, a lot of it, a lot of what happened in that room resonates with what we're talking about on stage, right? For the first part of the meeting, it was really about convincing people that we actually cared about what they had to say, and that they actually had intentionality and power, and that what they said actually would matter, and we would listen to it, and we'd address it in the product. And at the same time, I had to also say, yeah, your complaints about 311 service, like I get it, and I get that, I get what drives it and motivates it, which let's face it, said the city is not a fair city for a variety of reasons, we don't need to get into all of them at this moment. But, you know, I'm gonna acknowledge that from you, so at least you've heard it from somebody at the city that I recognize that I'm here trying to work on the same set of problems. And for this set of stuff, I can promise you we can actually have change based on what you say. So I'm gonna share that we have a little bit of power together. Yeah. So that was cool, and so stuff like that I'm excited by. It. And I'm excited by the fact that uh, my commissioner says that she wants that kind of stuff to happen. I'm excited by the current mayor. Like, I know politically there's a lot of other stuff that you can be very unexcited about him on, and I, I get that, and I'm right there with you. But at least in this place, at least I, I exist, right? They opened the role, they put me there, and I'm out there, and I can go talk to people and figure out how we make 311 more accessible and inclusive for people. And so that part's good. The, again, the bad part is like, we've got 180 years of, of stuff behind us. A lot of it was not designed, so we've got another 180 years in front of us where we got to do twice as much work, you know, to make it a little bit better. I have a question. I would like to know how both of you were introduced to design, so. Tonight is my first introduction. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't even know. Like the word design to me is, is like water. Like it, it can take so many states. It can be like solid or liquid or gas or all these different things. I, I just, um, it's, uh, it's something that I, I don't think I've ever been super conscious of, but I just know that people who know how to do it are able to make outsized impact on their world. So I think I've always been interested in design, um, not only of like actual objects, but also of social interactions and of power, and who who's getting, like how are systems designed to keep people having power or to share that power to, to generate new power? And so um, I was recently introduced to this term, and I know it might sound, uh, I don't know, highfalutin, but social practice artist. Do you guys know that terminology? But like, I, I read that, I was like, sweet, that's what, that's what I like to do. It's like, create, design, design social situations so that power dynamics shift. Um, and I don't know that that's something that would be in like the design, the academy of design, but I feel like it's an emerging um, field and it has a lot of roots in Chicago as well. So I don't even, I don't even know. What about you? I, I feel like it's a similar kind of bumbling path. Uh, not that you may be experiencing that right now. But I, when I got to the Chicago Architecture Center, I was brought on basically to I mean, just straight up, like, we're a 50-year-old organization, we want to raise a capital campaign, we need to figure out what we're doing with education. Like, can you figure that out? And I was like, yes, I can. And, um, and the thing that I kept bumping into was like, oh, I've heard about design thinking. Didn't that come out of the business school world? Because I was teaching social impact. And, and then like, oh, I started reading about it, and I was like, oh, this is really just like the five E's in biology, where like you explore, and then you explain, and all these things, whatever. And, and then I was like, oh, I actually completely do this. <laughs> this is what I do. I backwards design. And in the world of education and kind of when you think about experience and reflection, there's so much about the design process that I, you know, now it's become much more professionalized for me in terms of as an activist and advocate. But I had a similar experience where I was like, Oh, I actually do this. This is how I think. I think kind of like a hacker. I kind of think about process. I'm a community organizer. That's design. You're listening. You're iterating. You're listening again. You're going back. You're checking in. So there were all of these elements that I feel like I've come up with as a, I don't know, person. And then started to have language and a name. The transformative part for me, though, was really understanding the built environment because I basically was like 46, and I was like, what's urban planning? Seriously, you can be a, you know, go to a pretty good school and be like, what's urban planning? And I think understanding that, like, this building did not grow. It's not like birds dropped some seeds and a building grew. And I spent my whole life never really paying attention to the power of the built environment and, like, the political frothness of, like, who gets to decide. That's really where kind of, like, my brain started exploding. 
I have a quick question for Verna, if that's all right. Um, so, kids, you know, up to a certain age, I don't know what the magic age is, if you ask them if they're an artist, they're like, of course I'm an artist. And then there's a certain age where they suddenly are like, oh no, I can't draw, or I'm not this, or I'm not that. From your experience in working with younger folks, is there any sort of intervention you feel like you could share with all of us to help remind and, and instill the fact that like they are artists, or they are creative, they are designers, and what is like the, the prime age to, to reach them, to have them believe that and not lose their confidence? Thank you, that's a good question. I, I would say, first of all, um, you know, the formidable years, as we know scientifically, are is the very early stages in life. So what you tell a young person at those very early stages really puts them on this path, right, of, of excellence or self-doubt or whatever it may be. Um, and, and in the communities we serve, we, we run into, we, we don't run into perfect young people. You know, they, we come and they, they have life issues and all kinds of things. One of the first things we do is we talk about excellence. So at the beginning of our programs, and I have a couple of our uh, students are here actually to see now. I don't know where they went, Benicia and, and Jared. There, there's Jared right there, and Benicia in the back. So clap for them, y'all, please. Because one of the things we do in talking about excellence is we let them know that they belong, you know? So with an event like this, I was, you know, so you guys, there's this event, and I think when you asked me about being on the panel, one of my responses was, sure, I don't mind speaking on the panel, but I want my kids to come. You know, because we're um, very happy. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am too. Thanks, y'all. Uh, so, so it's about that exposure and the reinforcement through action. So it's one thing to tell a person you belong, you, and then it's another when they're walking up the door closes on them, right? And so one of the things we do, and I love uh, Dave Ajay, uh, this architect uh, that, of course, did the uh, museum, the Smithsonian. I know we all know about his amazing ways, but a lot of his architecture and, and things that he designed doesn't have doors on them. And that's because he said doors are actually designed to let people know they're not supposed to come here. You know, not the reverse, you know. And so he says, a lot of my buildings, I, I, when I work in them, you'll notice there are these translucent, you walk right on through and back out the back end. And, and, uh, and, and I think that that's what we try to do with our young people. We try to tell them, look, there, there are no doors, but, but the ones that people put up because of fear or because of these keep out, you know, are, you know, we have to be careful of, again of how we say things. So we, we speak a certain language to, to, to our young people. We'll say things like, when we do our programs in the morning, we discuss what we're gonna do, we'll say no exceptions. So that's raising that bar and standard of excellence. Another thing we do, this may not, this may seem a little outdated, but I'm gonna talk, say it anyway. With our young men, we talk about them being gentlemen with the young ladies that's in the, you know, because in the communities and places where we're from, they've told, well, you know, you're just so cutthroat, you're this, this, this. You know, you can learn a lot just by opening the door for someone, you know, or just by saying, you, you go first. So, it, so what we do is we try to not just talk about in being inclusive, but really uh, uh, doing it through action. And, and, uh, and, and as corny as it is, you, when you show love and personal interest in a person, uh, that, make, that helps them to soar. I feel like, I don't know if you've seen this, but I feel like the young people that are like, the ones that have the hardest time sitting down in school are born designers. Like, I, I really feel like they're squirrely. You know what they're noticing? They're noticing everything. Their antenna are up for all kinds of things in addition to whatever is on the paper in front of them. And so I think the hallmarks of great designers, right? Being super curious thinking outside the box, connecting things that don't seem like they're connected. Like the tendencies for young people that maybe struggle the most in a kind of a school system are actually the tendencies that make for really great design thinking and designers. And so I just wanna share that as we talk about like the space we need to be making on purpose for young people. It also is, 
got to be about seeing the designer in them when they don't see it in themselves. Because those are the skills you all wish you had on your best of day. And they've got them in spades and more. They don't have the language. They don't have the space. They don't have the social capital. Back to like, if you want to have everybody be a designer, you got to work on that. It's not just going to happen. Yeah. I, I think that's something that we can all do in this room to really empower the next generation to use these skills and open the door. So I know we can ask questions uh, all day, but I'd like to get the audience involved. Um, we have so many questions. Great. Let's start right here. Hi, uh, my name is Liz. I'm a designer here in Chicago, and I'm mostly an HCI. And um, in the disability community, you can't see me. I'm sitting in a wheelchair. Um, the disability minority is often left out of these very often diversity quotas or diversity talkings. And every workplace I've worked in, there's never been anyone in a wheelchair. I always have to go into a new space and bring my experience with me. And one of the things I think makes me very uh, apprehensive about calling everyone a designer is I don't know if everyone has been taught or knows how to feel empathetic with the people they're designing for. So I know so many people who are like, well, we passed the ADA 25, 28 years ago, so every building's accessible, right? <laughs> I've literally had students say that to me. And then, you know, I can make friends with people who are suddenly like, oh, we can't go to that restaurant because there's a step. And I feel like that empathy is something that is super important, and I want to know how you are either tackling that every day and what you would do to teach someone that that's, like, important. Jason, that's awesome. Do you wanna oh, jeez. Oh, <laughs> <I feel like, laughs> right. No, I'm okay. no, that's awesome. It's a great question. Um, so there's a couple components to it. So let's see. Starting back with how do you teach empathy? That's really big, right? I think um, I was lucky enough to go work with the Dalai Lama Center in Vancouver for this thing called um, UX for Good, and it was all about social emotional learning and basically how do you do. That. How do you teach empathy to people who might not be in situations where they've learned it or had it taught to them or had it shown to them, right? Because they don't have the right background or like they didn't, you know, they weren't lucky enough to have that. Um, I really don't know how you teach empathy, to be honest with you. It's something we struggle with a lot. Um, some of the things that I've done internally are to produce reports, which it sounds weird, but like videos, right? Just showing people, like, oh, what is that experience actually like for somebody? We're doing this right now with 301. So like, um, I've done a bunch of manual accessibility evaluation stuff that's great, but at the end of the day, what will actually let us know whether it's accessible or not is testing it with folks who actually have the different conditions that require either you know, uh, different equipment or different browsers, different screen readers, things like that, and making sure that that happens. But like, within the city, I'm pretty lucky. We have the mayor's office for people with disabilities, so we at least have people who are responsible for it. But you're right, enforcement's terrible. And like within the city and within like ADA compliance for websites in particular, like governments get sued about 2% of all law cases or all lawsuits brought by like American Federation for the Blind over folks. So from my point of view, I just keep on saying when we talk about the 21st century city that we want to live in, we talk about it being an inclusive and diverse city and that if we actually believe in those things, we actually believe in transparency, then we'll show people and we'll also say like, here's the stuff we're doing. Here's the stuff that we're doing that we need to do better and actually engage the community in helping us do the work. Hire people with disabilities. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's absolutely right. <laughs> so if, if folks didn't hear that, she also said to hire folks with disabilities. And I don't want to promise anything, but we, we did put it in the budget this year and we're fighting for that. Uh, basically, with MOPD, uh, Department of Innovation and Technology, is fighting for an accessibility champion. Um, and we definitely want that person to be somebody from the community. All right, another question. Who else has questions out here? Um, we'll go right there. Hello, you all. Thank you, uh, Vernon. You said something about um, love and uh, personal interest as being critical to uh, helping people soar feel valued, and um, Jason, your experience uh, facilitating that, uh, that design workshop, I'll call it on the south side, and having to do all this catch up, just be like, you are being heard, is a testament to Gabe's comment on like, 
okay, maybe in the early 1900s we had this like, yeah, we're all like here to build a city, and, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you are here to build a city. But what are we doing about that today? Uh, it's the same conversation that 50 years ago, I was just reading earlier today, Dr. King's last book, he's, he's like, we got to get the point across that until we have this deep abiding faith in the power of love to overcome everything, and in the identity that we are all family together, we're not going to have true integration. And the same is true for we're not going to all be designers until we have this understanding. So I want to focus this kind of idea right now on the Chicago Design Week and to prompt you all to ask you, how can Chicago Design Week do better to get us toward that end? One is not to just, during Chicago Design Week, we can only think about serving the Chicago Design community. I think. <laughs> I mean, I think in really looking at, you know, as we talk about design and what it does and what we know it to, to be and sharing that, and like was mentioned, having that empathy, then it's a really broad stroke. And, and not just looking at, you know, Let's have some cocktails and let's, you know, talk about how important we are and, and all that, you know. Um, and again, I'm not watering down the, the, the talents and, and, and all that, but really looking at this from a community standpoint. To me, it's very similar to the, to the word diversity. I don't like that word because it's a placeholder word. You know, everybody, you know, when I would be working on projects and annual reports, I said, well, let's do a diversity. And so let's get a, Asian and black, and I'm, you know, and you put it on a book and then go, we're diverse, hey, no you're not, you know. Um, you just did a brochure with, you know, so I look at, you know, this, that stroke of, of, of design, this design week, similar, looking at really what can design do, and who should design be certain, you know, uh, how can it resonate with those who are already designers, and what should we really be speaking? What language should we be speaking to, to, to really those who aren't designers? Yeah, I think a lot of what we've heard from the panelists is about, uh, I like how you were saying before, opening the door. So with de as the design community, how do we reach out and not just have the people who are identifying as designers, and how do we really reach out to other communities? Um, we'll have one last question. Is um, I'm sorry, but I have a two-part question. Um, the first is: is how does design relate to science? Is it a form of scientific inquiry, or are they distinct in some way? Um, and then the second is: um, given that there's a lot of like pernicious design going on, especially with like user interface, what is the role of the designer as like an ambassador, or are they, or is their role for speaking out? Um, what does that look like? Take the first one. Yeah, good. I'm still thinking about this guy. Yeah, go I don't know. There's a lot. There's a lot going on here. Um, you know, this question about like what is the relationship between science and design was, I think, one of the parts of your question. And I was saying, you know, I'm not as an untrained designer. I don't know how specific designers would see it, but as someone who spent a lot of time in science, straight up, like not engineering and not technology, but science, you know. Science, whether it's applied or otherwise, is, is a lot about just describing the world, right? And describing it well enough that someone else can kind of try to see it in the same way and then you see, is that actually the right description? I'm oversimplifying. But it's a way of really like making sense of the world, that there are ways things work and how we describe them. And I feel like my, my understanding or the way I appreciate and what I appreciate about design is there's an in intentionality, right, and you're to designate back to kind of this definitional thing um, that's purposeful. And that's like, good science shouldn't really be purposeful. Like, science ought to be like, okay, science is a way the world works, and now we're describing it. Design should be purposeful. Now the mischievousness that's available, I'm gonna let somebody else who does not me answer that. <laughs> That'd be me. Um, yeah, I, I, How much I, mischief man, can we wreak as designers? Well, yeah, no, uh, a lot. Right? Like, <laughs> way, way too much. No, seriously, right? I mean, like, 
think that you can go back. There's every every technological innovation, right? Comes with some cost, right? It's who is it costing and where is that cost and what are we doing, right? So if you look at you know, let's limit it to design. You know, Victor Papinek started talking about this stuff back in the 30s or 40s. He's one of these Bauhaus people who, you know, and he started doing design work and then he had first things first and we said in the 60s, you know, uh, he wrote a manifesto about that stuff. He, he did the consumer package stuff for uh, Hershey's, right? He told them, hey, if you, I'll do this for you because if I don't do it, somebody else will take the commission. They'll make money and I won't. But in addition, I'm gonna make another commission, which is what if we did something else? And he actually created the category of energy bar, right? Energy bars didn't exist before. They was like, oh, what's a healthy alternative when people want to go to a snack bar and get something, right? So um, there's always been this kind of struggle between when you're a designer, you do have this power, and you're in this creative role, and what are you going to point that towards? It's, it's a weapon, right? As much as it could be something empathetic, it could be something very terrible for people. And we're dealing with this right now, especially with these online systems. And I, I think in particular it's going to be, I hate to say this, but it's going to be on the generation that's sitting in the audience, not on the people sitting up here, to figure this stuff out because you're the ones who are being more impacted by it. Right? We're, I, I grew up in an era where it was analog and I'm going to die in an era that's purely digital. Right? You're, you're coming out in that whole world that's just digital. So we're going to have environments where more and more the role of design is around experience, culture, we're designing these really ineffable things because now we can apply this toolkit towards them. And the questions of what we're designing and who we're designing for are going to be more and more important. And if they're being answered by people who got their exit from a Facebook or a Google or an Amazon, I guarantee you their answers are going to be far different than the ones for people who never got to experience the privilege of that kind of upside. So it's definitely going to be a new century for us to consider this kind of stuff. Thank you. Great. With that, I want to thank all of our panelists.